Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program. My name is Lena Wen, and I'm the 4-H Extension Agent for Fauquier County. Um, the purpose of this program is to highlight Virginia-grown produce and livestock that are raised on farms across the Commonwealth and demonstrate how to create a delicious and nutritious meal with a highlighted ingredient. This educational program will highlight Virginia agriculture, community nutrition, and farm to table connections and is brought to you by Virginia Cooperative Extension, which is an educational outreach program of Virginia's land grant universities, Virginia Tech, and Virginia State University. Virginia Cooperative Extension's educational programs are delivered through a network of faculty at these two universities, 108 county and city offices, 11 ag research and extension centers, and six 4-H educational centers. I encourage all of you to participate in your local VCE programs to learn more if you have not already. So today we're gonna to be focusing on tomatoes. Chris Mullins is a horticulture extension, expe extension specialist working out of um, Virginia State University. And he's first gonna teach us some about growing tomatoes. Um, then Molly Beardsley is going to teach us how to make a delicious salsa. And um, Marianne Hansen is our Q&A monitor for today. And Marianne manages the Virginia Tech Plant Disease Clinic. And so will be a great resource to any of you that may have tomato disease questions. Um, if you have any questions you, um, that you would like the presenters to answer, just make sure to type them into the Q&A box. Um, and we'll try to address as many of those as possible. So I will go ahead and hand it off to Chris. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Lena, I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be with you today, talking a little bit about tomatoes. We've got uh, you know a little time this afternoon, but we're obviously not gonna be able to cover everything about tomatoes, but I wanted to go through and hopefully um, talk about some things that might interest you. I know many of you out there that are listening are thinking about gardening and thinking about growing tomatoes. So hopefully today uh, we'll be, uh, you'll be able to maybe glean a little bit from, uh, from what we talk about. Um, I've got several videos that we'll go through and, and show those uh, as we go, but uh, I wanted to start off talking about, you know, in general about tomatoes. You know, obviously many of you know this is a, a warm season crop and in Virginia, uh, it's usually best planted uh, in, the, in the springtime and it runs through the summer. Uh, but it's, it's an annual in Virginia. It belongs to the nightshade family, uh, some of those crops you might, you might have heard of before. Um, worldwide, or let's think about in Virginia or nationally anyway, uh, it's commercially grown for the, mostly the fresh market, you know, to be eaten fresh. But there's also a lot of processing that goes on, uh, like in that uh, bottom left picture where it's machine harvested and then used to make paste and ketchup and all kinds of things like that. Uh, worldwide, probably the U.S. is about number three in production with China and India being one and two. So a lot of uh, tomatoes being produced in those areas. Lots of different types. We'll talk about that in a second. And for many of you as a home gardener, it's something that you like to grow uh, because it's fairly easy to grow uh, and it can be productive. You know, uh, a 10 foot row can yield a lot of many pounds, I guess, of tomatoes. So it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that people like to grow in the garden. Some people report there's as many as 10,000 varieties to, of tomatoes. And I know there's some of you out there that feel like you probably tried just about all those because you like looking for different ones. Um, and the world record is an eight pound tomato. That's a pretty good size tomato, I, I think. Um, and I know some of you are probably trying to, uh, to, to grow big tomatoes too. So that's, that's something to uh, aspire to. You know, this is something too, a fun fact that uh, tomatoes were thought to be in Europe and, and in the colonies, it was thought to be um, poisonous. So this, this tomato, this native of South America that's really made it all over the world and is, is very important worldwide, was kind of thought for a long time to be something that you shouldn't eat. Um, and in the U.S. anyway, the per capita consumption is about 20 pounds uh, a year. So that's, the, that's pretty good. There are lots of types of tomatoes. Uh, we think of the beefsteak type or the large ones, or maybe you might call them slicers sometimes that, you know, you you cut off uh, a slice and it's, it's enough for a tomato sandwich, for example, or a BLT. There's also cherry tomatoes that many, are fam for, many of you are familiar with that are very productive. 
and it takes so much labor to harvest them. And then there's the grape ones, like you see in the picture there. Tomatoes on the vine are, have become important, and you're seeing those more and more in the grocery stores where you see uh, the whole cluster uh, of tomatoes or truss of tomatoes that's uh, harvested the same at the same ripeness, and it's on a green stem with the calyxes attached. There's also paste tomatoes or uh, Roma tomatoes. These are ones that are very, uh, they're used in processing or used to make something else. Very, um, very meaty with uh, not a lot of uh, juice in, in those. And then there's lots of different colors, you know, in, in, in that way, red, brown, striped, purple, green. Tomatoes are usually thought of as either indeterminate or determinate. And that just means that determinate tomatoes tend to be ones, well, we'll, we'll go into it in a little bit. Um, there's also hybrids and heirlooms. We'll go over that in a little bit too. Well, here's the thing about the determinates and indeterminates. Um, the indeterminate ones are ones that will grow and get really tall and, and, and long, and we use those in the greenhouse, but they will continue to have flowers and fruit uh, just as they grow, and they're very they're steady in the way that they produce. The determinates, or some people call them short stake varieties, are a lot of the ones that you see that are commercially grown on black plastic. If you travel, for example, in Virginia to the Eastern Shore, you'll see these. Um, and they are going to tend to have a flush of flower, fr uh, flowers and then fruit all at the same time. Um, and then they will continue to, to grow and produce fruit, but it's kind of all for one harvest. The growth habits of tomatoes is, is, is such that they have a, a main stem and you have the leaf uh, that comes off and in that leaf axle, a, a side shoot will, will emerge there or a, people call them suckers. And that's why at every leaf axle, you'll have a sucker that will actually come out and produce flowers and fruit. And so in the garden, many times people will get these really bushy plants that they put the cages around and sometimes they fall on the ground or fall over. Uh, so sometimes people will sucker tomatoes or take those side shoots off, not completely, but they might take a few off to maybe make the plant a little less um, uh, bushy and, and large so it might produce a little better tomatoes. Now there are types of tomatoes as far as the hybrids. These are ones that have, you know, are thought of as modern varieties. Um, these have been developed through breeding programs, conventional breeding programs uh, from universities and from, from companies. And they're most of the ones that you think of like um, the Celebrity, Mountain Fresh, Big Beef, uh, Early Girl, some of those very common varieties. Um, and what, what breeders are doing, they're looking for attributes from, from, from this particular tomato and this particular tomato, and they hybridize them. And, and it might show uh, those, they're looking for attributes that are good. And some of them have disease resistance. Um, and sometimes you'll look on the tomato seed packet and you'll see things like an F or a V. And those mean, uh, those letters usually will mean that uh, there's some, dis some disease resistance that's been kind of bred in for things like F fusarium or even N like nematode or TSWV uh, would be like tomato spied wilt virus. So it means that they are, there is some resistance to those things. So that makes them, you know, very, very good from a commercial standpoint. If somebody's growing tomatoes as an enterprise, as a business, they're able to have some consistency in these hybrids high yield also, but they also maybe have some disease resistance, which is important because they don't want a crop failure. Um, saving seeds from some of these hybrids, though, might not be a good idea because generally, well, you might not get the same fruit, for example, that you'd get from the uh, seed that's from the fruit that you took the seed from and saved. So it might revert to one of the parental types and it won't, uh, might not be the same. It might be something very different, something that you don't really want. The others I'll mention are heirloom varieties. Now, when you hear that word heirloom, you think of old things or something that's passed down. And that's basically what we think of when we think of heirloom varieties and vegetables. And when we think of tomatoes, it's the same thing. These are varieties that have been maybe selected for, uh, for something uh, in the past, maybe flavor or color or, or something else, and maybe have been passed down, sometimes through families or sometimes um, then they become kind of commercialized, they can, but they still can be, can be very good. And these are just some examples. You've maybe heard of things like Cherokee Purple or Green Zebra, or if you look at that uh, bottom one called Valencia, kind of looks a little bit like an orange, right? So these heirloom varieties don't have as much disease resistance kind of built into them, 
and they're not quite as high yielding as some of the hybrids. Uh, so from a production standpoint, might not be as good for a commercial grower that needs volume and consistency, but for many homeowners and, and actually consumers are more interested in these, becoming more interested in these, this might be something fun to grow. Uh, the heirlooms like Brandywine and Green Zebra is one that we've grown in the past in trials and uh, has great flavor and people really, really tend to like that. I was, uh, I'm going to share with you a video right now. Uh, a while back, I was talking to someone growing some heirloom tomatoes in Chesterfield County. And let me show you that video right now of what we talked about. Well, hi, today we're in Chesterfield County, Virginia. We're at the historic Castlewood House and we're going to be talking about heirloom tomatoes uh, for you in the garden. And here I'm with uh, Pat Robley. Pat, nice to have you on the show today. We really appreciate you letting us come out and Thanks talk with you. Thanks for coming out to the garden. Well, good. Tell me, what are you doing here? What, what are we seeing behind us? Well, um, the plants in, these, in this garden comes from the Chesterfield Historical Society heirloom tomato plant sale. Okay. Um, we normally have that in April over at the Chesterfield County Museum. Um, Chesterfield Historical Society volunteers and Master Gardener volunteers help me grow about 30 kinds of heirloom tomato varieties. And we have almost all of them in the garden here um, today. It's an edu educational garden here at Castlewood. Um, That's great. I noticed, I, I was, as I was walking through earlier, I saw, saw, saw so many varieties. And I know some of the gardeners in the area are very interested in this. Is that kind of what started this? Well, yes, and it's the tie-in to history um, that the Historical Society is recognizing that, you know, this is our heritage and the heritage of, um, you know, people who came from various countries. Um, many of the heirlooms came with immigrants who, you know, came from um, uh, countries like we have here represented in the, in the garden, varieties from Germany, England, uh, Poland, Yugoslavia. And so, um, you know, it's that connection to history that, that's so important to us. Well, we're back in the garden here now, and uh, Pat has done a great job keeping this area neat and clean, and the production is great on these. So why would you want to grow heirlooms? Well, these are varieties and things that you can't really get at the grocery store. People grow heirloom tomatoes because of the flavor especially, and they're also different colors and shapes. They're really, really neat things to eat, and people love that. Uh, this is a, a really nice plant here. It's very large. Most of these varieties get very big, and so you want to make sure that you've got a cage that can support them, uh, and they won't get blown over in the wind. Uh, speaking of, of really big tomatoes too, this is one called Mortgage Lifter, and this fruit is just wonderful. You can see uh, just a really large fruit here, hence the name Mortgage Lifter. Uh, great, nice kind of a, a light red color. Going to be really nice to eat. We might take this one home and eat it a little bit later. Uh, overall, this is a really nice plant. Uh, let's go look at some of the others she's got back here now. All right, this is another one called uh, Opaca, and this is a paste tomato, as you can see here. It's, it'd be used to, to make tomato paste for sauces and things like that. Just another example of, of uh, the differences that you get here in some of these older varieties. Now, disease can be a real problem with heirloom varieties, older varieties, compared to hybrids or newer modern uh, varieties that have some dis uh, disease resistance built into them or bred into them, these don't. So you really have to help these plants uh, during the growing season. You don't want you don't want a lot of free water, for example, on the leaves. You know, you can have uh, fungal problems because of that. So when you irrigate these, these plants, and I think you should irrigate them, that, that really gives them a, a good start on the production season, um, you should water at the bottom, maybe with drip irrigation or soaker hoses or with watering cans. I would stay away from overhead irrigation for these. Like I said, that free water on the leaves just gives more chance for fungal problems to, to occur. Well, this is another variety. This is Brandywine. Many of you have heard of that, of that particular one. We talked about irrigation. As you're irrigating here, you don't want a lot of that moisture in the soil to evaporate, and you can do that with uh, mulch. Now, you notice Pat has put some, uh, there's some newspaper down, so she planted, put some newspaper down, and then she's covered it with a lot of this bark. So that's going to, and you see there's hardly any weeds, I don't see any weeds in here. So she's, she's kept the weeds down, she's also kept the moisture in the soil and at the root zone, so when she does water, you don't lose a lot of that. That's important. That's one definite thing to think about with the heirlooms. Um, 
You need to really pay attention to how much you water. Not too much because a lot of these have thin skins and you'll, you'll get some cracking, but not too little because they really need the water also. Uh, one other tip, uh, you need to not give these varieties as much nitrogen as you would typical hybrid varieties. So you need to think about that. Cut it by about 25% and these will grow great. Well, these heirloom tomatoes can be really great for the home gardener. The experienced gardener are going to have a lot of fun with these, and even a new gardener can give these a try. I would recommend maybe if you want to make sure you have tomatoes for the end of the season to plant some hybrids along with these, and sometimes you might want to plant a little more of the heirlooms than you normally would. Uh, in case you have a crop failure, you still would have some that you can eat at the end of the summer. So for more information about heirloom plants, and especially heirloom tomatoes, please contact your local county extension office. Your master gardener can help you out with that. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins, and we'll see you next time. So you can probably see that heirlooms might be an interesting, uh, interesting crop for you. Uh, in, in Virginia, you all buy, buy tomatoes at the grocery store and at the farmer's market and things like that. America's in the middle of a failed financial experiment. More than half of all the family. Um, and so there's lots of places to find tomatoes and, and farmer's markets and far roadside stands are certainly one of those places. So if we look in the, in the U.S., Virginia is usually a a top producer in, in tomatoes, and that's, that's a good thing. So we have outdoor production, as you see in these pictures, big fields, a lot of that going on. We have a lot of what we call protected culture. That's gonna be in greenhouses or high tunnel structures uh, where the uh, production is very high, it's very high tech, and you're starting to see more and more of those tomatoes in the grocery store. That might be called greenhouse tomatoes, hothouse tomatoes, uh, they usually are very, uh, very attractive and, and they usually taste pretty good too. Now I was able to uh, visit us a, um, a commercial operation, but a um, more of a small farm uh, operation in Boynton, Virginia, um, a just a few weeks ago. And I wanted to show you what uh, they're doing there. Hello and welcome. Today we're in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. We're at the historic Cabbage Farms. I'm here with the owner and operator, Mrs. Mariana Bose. Mrs. Bose, thank you for letting us come out here today and talk to you. Well, thank you for coming. I know you grow a lot of different things here. You've got strawberries and blueberries and you grow a lot of vegetables, but I want to know about tomatoes today. What kind of varieties of tomatoes do you grow here? Well, we have Biltmore, Celebrity, Better Boy, uh, the yellow tomato, the cherry tomato. <laughs> Just most any kind you would want. So everybody can find the tomato they like right, here then. Right. All right. How's your spring been for, for tomatoes? Uh, not too good for the ripening, but we have plenty of tomatoes on the vine, but they're just not red yet. Well, they're going to they're gonna ripen up soon, though. Yeah, uh, they will be here soon, plenty well, of them. We're going to go and look at your tomatoes right now. Okay. Well, we're here with Marilyn Estes. Marilyn is a small farm agent with the... Uh, VSU Small Farm Program, and I know you work with uh, commercial growers, but also maybe some gardeners in Southside Virginia. Right. So here at Cabbage Farm, they're growing lots of vegetables that we see behind us. <clears throat> we want to talk a little bit about tomatoes. Do they have a, is it a pick your own tomato operation or how do they do this here? No, she, um, she has a, a helper here and they pick tomatoes in the morning and bring them to her stand and they sell them there. So they just, people come in, buy them right there, right. fresh right off the vine. Right. Yep. Oh, that's great. Well, I notice I look behind me, I see lots of different sizes of tomatoes, some yep. taller, some shorter. I'd really like to go over and see some of them and talk about how they grow them here. Okay. Yep. They do a great job here. Good. Well, Marilyn, I notice, I know there's different varieties here, but you can really see different heights and things. Right. They, they make a difference, the varieties, right? Yep. Yeah, you know, they have, she has several different varieties and each, each grows, you know, at a different height. And um, that's why they have the stakes here with the strings to support the vines to keep them off the ground and keep air circulating around them also to keep them from rotting it as bad. So this is different. A lot of times in the garden, you know, we'll put something like a, a cage around them. Right. So this does, it, does the same thing, right? It sure does. And it, it, what this, it, if you had to cage every one of these, it'd be a lot more work. So this, this is a little more efficient using the, the, the uh, string and the stakes here. So the stake 
and every few plants there's a stake, maybe every one or two plants, and then a string, and that just keeps it from moving back and forth and falling down. Right. And as the plants grow, they, they add the additional string for more support here. And I notice with the, the uh, cherry tomatoes, they get much taller, so they've got much taller stakes. Right. They actually are using the um, T-post over there, okay. which are taller than these little wooden stakes, and that really helps support those. They um, actually, here, she has very, very high production on the small cherry tomatoes, so they need a lot of support. They're very productive anyway. They are. <laughs> I noticed too that they've got black plastic around the plants. Why do they do that? Well, they, they use a raised bed here, and they put the plastic down. Helps, con, you know, control the weeds, and it keeps uh, some of the um, fruit from being on directly on the ground. It, you know, helps prevent rottening too. Okay. So if a home gardener wanted to do something, they wouldn't have to buy this stuff. They could maybe put straw around right. it, and that'll help uh, keep the water from evaporating right. and it would keep maybe some weeds down. Now they have to water this, don't they? Yes. They have drip tape here okay. under all of these and they are irrigate when Mother Nature doesn't provide enough rain for it. So for a home gardener, what could they use to irrigate? Well, a, a soaker hose would work great, you know, for a small area and if you didn't want to go into the uh, drip irrigation system. Okay, and it just puts the water right at the root zone. Right. So the leaves don't get wet, you don't have a problem maybe with as much disease issues. Right. Yep. Oh, I like and that. rot also. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, just a really nice, productive system they've got here at Cabbage Farm. They do a great job. Yes, they do. They, they put a lot of hard work into this, and they take a lot of pride in what they produce, and everything she sells here is grown here. Well, good. I know there's going to be some ripe ones pretty soon. Yep, they're getting ripe. They um, need a little more sunshine to uh, get them going, but as you can see, there's a lot of fruit on these vines, and so hopefully she'll have a great year. Well, great. Marilyn, thanks for com coming out and talking to us about the tomatoes today. Thank you for coming. Well, for more information about growing tomatoes in the home garden, contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative extension visit their website at ext.vt.edu all right so cabbage farms is a kind of an example of a kind of a small family-owned operation so i would encourage all of you all to grow tomatoes yourselves but if you can go find your local small farmer that's growing tomatoes and buy from them um, so as you're thinking about growing tomatoes in your home garden um, there's some things that you need to think about that you kind of need or that would be good and that's that's well drained soil uh, tomatoes like to be uh, they don't like to necessarily sit in water if you can get some organic matter into that soil through compost or some other type of, of way you know good organic matter in the soil is good for tomatoes uh, tomatoes like a lot of crops will probably like it around six to six two or six five for their ph level um, as Tomatoes need good light, so uh, you don't want a lot of shade. Just like many of the summer vegetables, six to eight hours of, uh, of sunlight is going to be good for tomatoes. And remember, these are this is a crop that really doesn't like frost, so um, they will die quickly, too early, or into the fall. Um, a, a good frost is going to kill these plants. Uh, so just remember that. I know everybody's always trying to get some earliness. Um, and it's really fun to be the, the first uh, neighbor in, in the area that's got, uh, you know, tomatoes in, in June and things. So, uh, but sometimes you can push it a little too far and lose some plants. Um, it's important to keep the tomatoes off the ground. And just like in that past video where we showed, um, or the, the heirloom video where you saw the cages, just like this top picture, many of you have used cages, have made cages, you can buy cages. Uh, but they do a nice job of keeping the tomatoes kind of contained, keeping the fruit and the, uh, the vines off the ground. And more commercial growers, or, or if you're growing long rows of tomatoes, just like a cabbage farm there, um, the, this string weave system, it's kind of sometimes called the Florida string weave, is a nice way to, uh, to keep the plants from, uh, from falling over and, and, and keeping them. It's, you're kind of sandwiching the, uh, the stem and all the uh, side shoots and things uh, on between string and it keeps them from moving. Um, <clears throat> when we think about the needs of the plant, I think uh, watering is important. 
uh, even for the home gardener for consistency and, and yield uh, and to have a successful uh, time gardening. Sometimes being able to irrigate is important. For, for tomatoes during fruit development, from flower development all the way through fruit development, it's important to have, uh, to have water during that time. That's really the critical watering period for, for tomatoes. Uh, also watering them in good when you plant them. Uh, but if you think about when tomatoes grow and when a lot of the fruit and, and flowers, uh, flowers and fruit are on there, um, it generally can be a time in Virginia, in a lot of Virginia, where we see drought conditions. And so it seems like more often, often than not, we have a two to three week period sometime in July or, or late June where we, we don't see uh, rain for a little, uh, you know, don't see that much rain. So uh, being able to use something like a soaker hose um, can be... Uh, can be something that that's that's pretty good, and uh, and having fertile conditions uh, for the uh, tomatoes are somewhat of a heavy feeder, also. I think we're going to keep going for the sake of time because you, uh, I was going to show a staking video, but I think we understand the way that that those tomatoes are staked up. Um, the best thing to do when you think about fertility in your garden, regardless of what you're growing, but especially with tomatoes, is to maybe think about a soil test. Uh, every few years, it's a good idea to do a soil test. You kind of see that center uh, picture. There's a soil test box that you can get from your local county extension office, and they can help you figure that out. Even as a as a home grower, um, home gardener, you can you can test your soil, and they'll help you even with uh, uh, interpreting the results that you get from that soil test uh, from Virginia Tech. And so. Uh, you've got a form that you'll say what you want to grow and it'll give you some recommendations and that'll give you a good idea and it'll get you started in the right way. So you can look at fertility or, or the way to feed the plant with organic fertilizers or synthetic fertilizers. They can be water soluble, uh, something granular, something slow release, um, lots of ways to feed your plants. Uh, and like I said before, tomatoes are relatively heavy feeders, uh, but you do need to find a balance because you're after a nice strong plant, but you're also after fruit. And so sometimes too much nitrogen can, can really give you lush, heavy growth, vegetative growth, and not as much on the fruit side. So you kind of have to find a balance uh, of feeding them too much and not enough. Um, and a lot of times people will, with their tomatoes, they'll add fertilizer before they plant, and then they might, they might also, or, or they might side dress with some type of fertilizer. They might uh, also, uh, through their drip irrigation, they might add some uh, water-soluble fertilizer that you might um, be familiar with or find at a garden center or a home improvement warehouse. And then there's also other amendments that you can add, compost and lime and sulfur to adjust the pH and things like that. So <clears throat> lots of amendments, uh, lots of fertilizers, uh, and, and there's lots of recommendations out there about what to do. Usually a complete fertilizer that's um, fairly balanced is going to do a, a pretty good job with tomatoes. So when we think about planting the tomatoes and when we're going to plant, uh, like I mentioned before, the tomatoes are in most of Virginia are going to be early spring that you're going to put, uh, you're either going to put transplants in the ground that's going to be young plants or it's going to be seeds, but more often than not people are going to be putting transplants in the ground. Like you see that picture on the top right, there's a uh, a young plant that's being put in the ground, it's coming out of a tray, then those can be, um, you can buy those, you know, at garden centers. And you can also, if you've got a small greenhouse or grow lights in your basement, it's something that you can uh, germinate from seed yourself and get out there into the, into the, uh, into the ground once the ground temperatures warmed up into the, um, into the 60s, uh, you can put that out. Um, most of the time in the garden, people are planting uh, just in, in ground, bare ground, maybe on hills, or they might be growing in some type of raised bed, like the picture that you see there. Um, tomatoes, there's lots of different size tomatoes. There's uh, smaller ones, and like we talked about, indeterminate varieties are usually spaced a little closer than, I mean, further apart than determinate varieties. But in general, if you have rows of tomatoes, um, you have the rows that are about four to six feet apart. And in between the rows, the, the plants can then be anywhere from a, a foot and a half to three feet apart, depending on how big uh, that particular variety gets. Um, you also wanna water that transplant in well as you're 
as you're putting it in the ground, make sure it's watered well. That water will, will help it uh, stay, uh, will help keep it from wilting, but it'll also make sure that there's no air pockets around the root. Uh, and so it'll do well that way. Uh, with tomatoes, you can, you can cover the stem uh, with soil uh, and it will send up, uh, you will get roots off the stem. And containers, for many of you out there, if you just have a patio or a deck that you want to grow something, uh, uh, just a one tomato, for example, uh, containers can be, a, can be a great way to go for you. And so let's look, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about containers here, and you can kind of see some of the differences uh, in different containers. Well, hello and welcome. Today we're at Virginia State University's Randolph Farm, and we're going to be talking about growing vegetables in containers. And many of you, as we're moving towards uh, spring and, and summer, are thinking about growing vegetables. So uh, maybe container gardening would be for you. Uh, and most any container can work. We've got a, a variety of ones here, large ones. We've got some small ones. Now this one right here might not be a great one for, for most uh, plants, but some of these will. And it really depends on what you're growing. For example, tomatoes are going to require a much larger um, container to be, to be grown in than something like um, some of the herbs. So, so you just have to kind of think about what you want to grow. So once you find your container, we're going to think about really what to put in the container. I would stay away from garden soil from the, from the land. Uh, it's going to dry out really quick and harden up and not drain very well. So something like this right here, this uh, media, this is what we call soilless media, and it's got bark and peat moss in it and perlite and a few things like this, and uh, it does a really nice job of, uh, of uh, staying, staying moist but also staying dry enough for the roots that, uh, of the plant that's grown in there. And we've got some in this container right here, and this is a very large container, so I'm gonna, we're going to grow, we're going to plant right, right now, we're going to plant a tomato in here. Now we We've got nice tomatoes, like you see here, that you can find at your local garden center, uh, short, ready to go. But also, you can find larger ones sometimes, like this here. And uh, we're going to put this one in here. This one's already got flowers on it. Uh, what we're going to do is take this out of this container. It's actually also got a uh, uh, stake in it. We'll put that back to help keep it up. And we're going to kind of make a time to get dirty. We're going to kind of open up a hole right there and we're going to pull it out of the pot and you can see this has a pretty good root ball uh, it's kind of will break it just a little bit and move it around a little bit and we're going to bury this pretty deep in here um, and uh, there's no leaves under here so we've taken those leaves off and uh, we're going to add a little bit more media to this around here kind of going to get this up, not to the very top, because we want to be able to water it and have that water not uh, flow over. We're going to put this little small stake in here right now, just to kind of keep it going for right now. And maybe a small, maybe a sandwich tie, just to lightly make it stay on here. Later, we might use a cage for this, because tomatoes are going to get really big and bushy. Uh, or maybe a series of, of stakes uh, on three sides. And uh, But that's going to do very well. We're, we would water this in, you know, have a nice... Uh, you know, a wand and a water breaker, water it in. The nice thing about these containers when you water is that um, you can water right, you know, right at the root zone. You don't have to get the leaves wet. Uh, and that makes it nice because you have less disease pressure and problems potentially if you have less water on the leaves. And that's another thing to think about. When you water, uh, you want to make sure that all these plants, these pots, have some type of drainage holes in the bottom. Uh, you don't want a container that's completely solid uh, as the the water will just stay in there and most plants don't like to stay wet all the time so make sure that you've got leach holes in the bottom drainage holes or if you don't use a drill and uh, and drill those holes in there when you think about herbs maybe a smaller container all right i think we'll we'll stop there because we look we saw the the tomato being planted um but you can see that containers could be um could be good for many of you. Uh, just, uh, you know, there's even tomato varieties that are kind of well, very well suited uh, for patios, patio type varieties that are going to be very short in stature and, and, and not get to, too, too large for you. So that can be something to think about. Now, tomatoes um, 
are relatively easy to grow. They, uh, they take off, they do very well uh, with good fertilization and watering, but they can get some problems. Um, you can get um, insects and diseases. Uh, you can get physiological problems. You can get things like blossom and rot, um, maybe due to calcium not being moved through the leaves, uh, to the fruit. Uh, you can get cracks. Uh, you can get cat facing. Some of those things have to do with um, inconsistent or infrequent watering or issues like that. Watering is very important. I, I keep coming back to it, but I, I think it is important. Even that top picture that you see there with the soaker hose kind of winding around the crop um, can be a good way to think about things uh, of, of setting something up. But, but if you see blossom and rot sometimes, it might just be a watering problem. It's not, it's, it's calcium deficiency, but it's not necessarily that it's being, uh, that it's not available or not there. It's just not being moved to the plant. Um, and so, um, also, you can get deficiencies, maybe not having enough fertilizer or having uh, maybe too much fertilizer. You can have issues. Like I said before, uh, there are some insect problems. Uh, that bottom picture there, can you see that tomato hornworm? Really large tomato horn hornworm there that will really uh, eat away at your leaves and very quickly, almost overnight, uh, seems like it'll, it'll take a lot of the leaf area away from your <coughs> away from your crop. Other things like aphids and white flies and thrips and spider mites can be out there. Um, and you want to probably, most of you as home gardeners, want to think about uh, things like more natural uh, insecticides, maybe like neem or insecticidal soap or uh, BT products that uh, can be very helpful in, in um, uh, keeping some of these pest populations down. Uh, even uh, being able to maybe make a planting uh, near your garden with flowers that would attract beneficial insects, both predators. Many of you are familiar with ladybugs as being a general predator of a lot of the pests we think of, or even some of the parasitoids that, that come in, uh, the small uh, wasps and things. So you can um, plant some things around there that will help bring in a lot of these natural, uh, natural enemies of the pests that you have. And there are um, a fair amount of disease problems uh, that you can see, uh, blights, <coughs> viruses, fusarium, uh, resilium, things like that. And I'm really glad that Mary Ann Hansen is on the call and she's gonna be handling the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, but she, uh, she works in, uh, with the plant disease clinic at, at Virginia Tech. And so she uh, sees lots and lots of tomato problems all the time. So. Uh, if you have some questions about the tomato diseases, hopefully we'll be able to talk about that uh, during the Q&A session. Um, sometimes you just have to rogue the plants out though. If you think that you've got a virus problem, you just need to pull those plants out, get them away from uh, your particular site. Uh, sometimes even maybe succession planting and if you've got the ability to have different sites, um, sometimes that works also. So, and then you've got even things like squirrels uh, eating your tomatoes. So uh, lots of things want to get at them. Um, and you've just got to figure out a way uh, with some of these uh, mammalian pests, you've got to figure out a way to just to uh, exclude them from the, from the tomatoes. And there's always weeds. Um, any garden, tomato or whatever you grow in your garden are going to have weeds around it, both in the row middles and the rows. Uh, in the planting bed somewhere. And uh, mechanical cultivation using uh, cultivating hoes and tools is certainly one way to do that. And there are a lot of different um, types of cultivating hoes out there and ways to kind of get weeds uh, away from there. Some that are a little better than just the regular old chopping hoe that you're used to that might be a little better on your back. Uh, there are some herbicides that you can use um, if, you're, if, you're, if you desire to do that. Uh, there's some general um, non-restricted herbicides that you can use. But mulch is a good one, whether it's um, straw or newspaper or plastic, uh, woven ground cover. Uh, there, are, there are lots of different ways that you can mulch your crop. And like I mentioned before in one of the videos, not only does it keep or suppress weeds, but it also can help uh, keeping soil moisture evaporation down. So so weeds can be a problem, but uh, it's not insurmountable. You can, you can get through the, the weed issues. So we, you've grown your tomatoes and, and you're ready to harvest. Um, 
and so usually you want to harvest your tomatoes if, if they're a red variety you want to harvest them uh, let's just say you want to harvest them when they're mature whether it's red or whether they're a yellow variety but but whatever they're going to turn um, but sometimes things like those squirrels in the previous slide might try to get to the plant uh, the fruit before you do so you can harvest tomatoes when they're not quite dead red or completely ripe um, and they will continue to ripen um, sometimes you can put tomatoes in a uh, in a bag for example and the ethylene that they release um, will will help and th help them ripen up usually you don't want to put your tomatoes in cold storage or in a refrigerator or something like that that really will slow ripening and it's really not the best place to store uh, mature fruit either uh, variety selection um, while we haven't had a lot of time to talk about that variety selection is very important in so many fronts but it is important too on on uh, the maturity when it matures and how long it will how long of a shelf life it has um, variety is important in, in things even like um, some more some some varieties are more susceptible to things like blossom and rot that we talked about before so it's it's very important um, as you go through your seed catalogs or go through the online seed catalogs and uh, and really kind of look and see uh, what the maturity date is what if it has any resistance uh, does it store well things like that it's, it's real important so as we think that we, we've grown our tomatoes now we've harvested our tomatoes so Molly's now going to talk to us a little bit about what we might do with tomatoes after we've harvested them So when we choose tomatoes, we want to choose tomatoes that have a bright, shiny skin and are firm. And again, storing it at room temperature away from direct sunlight. But if you cannot use the tomatoes one week after they are ripe, then you would want to refrigerate them. And do not wash the tomatoes until you are ready to eat them and just wash by rinsing under running water. Uh, next slide. For this fresh salsa, you will need three tomatoes, two bell peppers, a half a cup of cilantro, a half a cup of onion, two teaspoons of lime juice, a half a teaspoon of salt. If you like spice, trade out the bell pepper for jalapenos. If you would like something to dip into this salsa, you can use carrots or try whole grain tortilla chips. Here's all my fresh produce. You could find most of this locally at a farm stand or farmer's market or at your grocery store. I've already washed all of my produce, so now I am slicing the tomato so I can make it easier for myself to dice. So I'll sort of hold this group of sliced tomatoes and it makes making the smaller cuts way easier. Add your tomatoes to the bowl. Now we're going to dice our bell peppers. So I go around and cut in a circle to scoop out the seeds and then I'll cut the bottom off and sort of just roll it out. And this makes dicing it a lot easier. So you'll just cut strips and then you'll cut those strips into even smaller pieces. Add your pepper to the bowl. Next, we will need a half a cup of chopped cilantro. and add that cilantro to your bowl. For lime juice, I roll my lime to get it nice and juicy, and we need two teaspoons, which is about half of a lime. For half a cup of onion, I used a fourth of a medium onion, and here I am dicing that onion. I personally don't enjoy large chunks of onion in my salsa, so I'm doing a rocking back and forth motion with my knife to make the pieces more even in size. Add the half cup of onion to the bowl. Add half a teaspoon of salt and mix well. If you like more of a chunky salsa, you can leave it like this, or you can add it to a food processor like I am going to. If you don't have a food processor, a blender will work just as well. Okay. 
scraping down the sides makes sure that all of the ingredients get blended up. It is recommended to refrigerate this for at least 30 minutes so that the flavors can intensify in the fridge. Enjoy this as a dip or use it as a topping. You can find this recipe or other healthy, delicious recipes on our website at eatsmartmovemoreva.org. All right. Wow, that looked great. Everybody loves salsa these days. So that was uh, very timely. All right. Well, I'm going to turn this over to Mary Ann, who's going to, if we've got any questions, maybe she can, uh, maybe Mary Ann, if you could talk for just a, briefly about the plant disease clinic at Virginia Tech and how somebody, even a home gardener, might be able to utilize that. Okay, great. Uh, I'll be happy to do that. Um, uh, the the plant disease clinic at Virginia Tech is actually a service to the extension agents in the counties, but anybody in any county in Virginia can go into their local county extension office and ask for help with diagnosing a plant problem. And then if the extension agent would like some backup uh, lab diagnosis or, or our opinion on it, then they can send that sample to us. So this is under normal operations. Um, unfortunately, right now we're under special operations with COVID-19. Um, so currently you need to submit your uh, plant problems as digital images first. Um, and we are only uh, taking physical samples at this time from commercial growers uh, after they've submitted digital images. But homeowners can submit digital images. So I would encourage you to go to your county uh, extension office and ask them about that process and we handle all kinds of plant problems and we get a lot of tomato questions. <laughs> um, and we got a few questions today. So I um, guess I'll launch into the questions. Chris, you talked about uh, container gardening and we had a question about container gardening. Someone had grown um, tomato plants in containers last year, one plant in each container and the plants looked good and produced flowers but they never produced fruit. And this grower felt like it wasn't an issue with bees because they had um, squash plants growing in containers that, that did produce squash fruit. So do you have any answers to that? Well, I have seen years and in, in the recent past where I've, I've heard that same problem, whether it was in containers or even outside, I mean, in, in the conventional production. Um, Sometimes uh, low fruit, in, I mean, low production of fruit in tomatoes can be a result of too much nitrogen. Um, that's possible, but I think they would probably have uh, have seen really, really green leaves and almost sometimes gnarled up leaves. Um, it more than likely is some type of pollination issue, even though that they uh, um, the the pollinators were out. Um, but I'm not really sure um, in particular what happened there. I think it would have to be a pollination issue though. So it wouldn't be an issue with, for example, the size of the pot, you were talking about pot size. Well, it can be, I suppose, but um, even in the greenhouse, you know, we grow uh, tomatoes, even large varieties, indeterminate varieties in just a small five gallon container. It's a little smaller than a five gallon bucket, but if you saw the video that I showed with that larger, more decorative pot, something that's 18 inches deep by, you know, 12 or 18 inches in diameter should be fine. So I'm not sure if, uh, did they say how big their container was? I can't remember. Uh, they, they did not. Right. No. I suppose right. it could, it could be. Uh, but the, the thing that you want to do with containers is you want to make sure that they're watered well. I didn't necessarily mention it on the video, but that soilless media that you use will tend to, uh, it has a tendency it can dry out quicker than you're thinking it might. And so making sure that it's watered well and making sure that there's good fertilization. That root, uh, the roots for tomatoes are very, it's a vigorous plant generally, and the roots are going to just fill that, uh, that up. So possibility, Marianne, but it, it, it might be more of a pollination thing. Yeah, and, and maybe the conditions around pollination were different when the tomatoes were blooming than when the squash well, that's, was blooming. That's exactly right, because uh, while the pollinators were out, maybe for the squash, they might not have been there because of temperature or something else during the, the tomato. Right. Okay, great. 
Um, everybody's Bane who grows a garden, deer. Do you have any <laughs> recommendations? Someone had deer eating the flowers off of their tomato plants. How to prevent that? Yeah, it's a question I, I get quite often actually. Uh, deer are a real issue. Um, there are a lot of kind of home remedies that you hear about, like um, you go get hair from a barber shop or soap that you, that you put around the garden on the perimeter. Some of those work to varying degrees and some work for a short amount of time. There are some deer away sprays that you can use that are effective, but again, they aren't really rain fast. They, once it rains, they're kind of gone, gone away. Um, Fencing can be a good one. Commercial growers will, will put up something called a, a 3D fence, uh, which is a wire. Uh, it's not, this doesn't have to be an electric fence, but it can be a um, high tensile wire that maybe there are two or three of these wires uh, going up maybe two, three, four feet high that are at a little bit of an angle. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's called a 3D fence. And what this does, the deer comes to the fence and he's easily able to jump over that fence. But because the the way that the it's arranged, um, it, he can't really judge how far away the uh, the wires are. So they kind of it kind of excludes them a little bit. Um, sometimes, and you know, you can plant uh, crops like edamame, which are vegetable soybeans, and the deer will kind of stop if that's on the perimeter of your garden. They will stop and browse and eat that rather than coming into the garden. Maybe even regular soybeans. So not a lot of great answers there but uh, maybe try and, try and a little bit, some of those might help. Great, yeah, I've seen some of that 3D fencing. A friend of mine has it around her, her yard just for her ornamentals and it seems to be pretty effective. It is, it so, is. Great, um, a question about pruning tomatoes. Um, someone's tomatoes have gotten out of hand and they wanna know if they can just top them now while they're still producing, while they're producing. Yeah, you generally can. Uh, so if you top the tomatoes, usually you're going to be topping one or two growing points. And if, it's, if you've let it get very bushy, you know, you're topping, you're stopping that area from growing. Of course, the other side shoots are going to keep growing. But yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly doable. Uh, they can get too bushy. And like I mentioned before, even, even light suckering, uh, taking those suckers off can help. Um, Sometimes in the greenhouse, for example, we will take leaves off, whole leaves off to make sure that we get air movement. Because probably the less as, as you know, Marianne, probably as you get uh, more dense foliage, you have probably more chance of problems happening, wouldn't you think? Right, right. If you and have so, a human canopy that favors fungal diseases. Sure. Exactly. So it's a good idea to think about that. But, but topping the tomatoes from the growing point, you can definitely do that. Okay. Great. Um, a question about watering. Uh, I was told not to water the plants until the soil is dry. Does this mean when it's completely dry or a little bit moist? All right, that's a good question. And, and watering kind of sometimes for a home gardener becomes an art really. Uh, you know, you, you don't want it to get completely dry, but you wanna be careful not over water. Um, if you have mulches over your, uh, over your rows or your raised beds, um, you're watering a little bit less uh, than bare ground, uh, but um, you still have to be careful. And it's one of those things where you have to watch. It's nice to automate your watering, but at the same time, it reduces your ability to really get a feel of when that, when that area is dry and when the plants need something. Tomatoes are pretty good about uh, letting you know when they, when they need water. You'll see that growing point start to flag a little bit. And uh, there is that permanent wilting point that you can get, get to on some of these uh, growing points and, and it won't come back from it. So you really don't want a very severe wilt at all. And I'm not really suggesting that you see, um, wait to water till you see a wilt, but it, you know if it's starting to wilt at the growing point, you probably need to, more often than not, you need to apply water. Um, there are some devices that you can buy, you know, um, they're called, they're a type of tensiometer. They're called irometers. And uh, you can find them at, uh, if you Google irometer, you'll find them. That's just uh, uh, the name, name of it. And uh, they're not terribly expensive. And you can put those within your row. And they kind of act like an artificial root. Artificial root they've got a, a gauge on them. And it kind of helps you judge 
uh, it, what it does is it judges root pressure basically. So it lets you know when you need to irrigate. So, so I don't know if that answers it, Marianne. There's, it's kind of an art. You kind of have to figure it out for your own garden um, because, you know, tomatoes need, you know, consistent watering. So you don't want uh, to let it get too, too wet one time and then really dry for the next, you know, over the next few days. You kind of want to give it consistent watering if you can. Okay, that was a tensiometer, is that what you said? Yeah, the, it's called an irometer. Irometer, how do you spell that? So I think it's I-R-R-O-M-E-T-E-R -E -E maybe? Something, okay. something like that. Okay. Um, and related to watering, someone asked, what is the best mulch to use around tomato plants? Um, well, the, the best mulch is probably one that is readily available to you, like uh, like straw mulch, uh, uh, newspapers maybe that aren't that have uh, that aren't don't have colored dyes in them, um, like we saw in Chesterfield County on that video. The uh, the bark, if that's readily available to you, that can that can be good. Pine bark around it can um, produce can leach a little can make the soil a little more acidic. So um, if if your pH in your soil is is high. Um, Pine bark around it can do a, can do well, but otherwise, um, if you've got good pH, it's six five. I wouldn't put pine bark around it. I, pine bark's more for things like azaleas and blueberries. Um, but those those things, plastic um, woven ground covers, I guess a, a really good one. Not plastic so much for the you know it can um, it restricts water from going in, but woven ground cover um, is something that you can find uh, at um, at different places, if you if you Google woven ground cover, you can find it, and it's it's a material that allows air and water to move through it, but it also restricts weeds, and uh, is is somewhat long lived, so you can reuse it over and over again. Uh, that can be a good one, also. Great. Okay, a couple of soil questions. Um, is there a way to measure your own pH of your soil? There is. Uh, you can do, uh, there's probably some instructions online that you can find about how to maybe uh, um, pour liquid through through soils and look for a pH of that. Um, there are some, I think there's some soil pH testers out there. Um, so you can, you can do some of that. Um, but I think generally it's probably easier in the long run to, uh, to send a sample in. Yeah, and the, the soil testing lab here at Virginia Tech will will um, do soil testing. So that's that's right. That's lab. that's what I mean. It's 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 easier sometimes to do that. They'll give you your your pH. They'll recommend if you need to adjust that pH based on uh, the uh, what you want to grow in that in that area. Okay, um, and then uh, someone is considering a small farm in Bedford County to grow heirloom tomatoes. Uh, what is the best soil type for heirloom tomatoes? Well, for any tomatoes, I think it's going to be something that we would we would think of as well drained. Um, you know, a clay soil. If you could uh, increase the organic matter in it, uh, you know, to three three percent or four percent, it's going to be really good by using compost or maybe uh, green manure crop. Something that can really uh, so preparing that soil ahead of time. Uh, it's going to be very important uh, for the tomatoes. Uh, and Bedford is going to have a little bit of clay soil there. So, so uh, if they can add some compost, that can be, uh, and fortunately there's some, uh, right around the Bedford area, there's some sources of good, of good compost that, uh, that, they can, that they can find. Uh, so that would be, a, I think, a good thing to think about doing. So just improving the organic matter and the drainage and yeah, I think that's Very good. Okay, here we've got a disease question. So uh, if you want, I can take that one, Chris. Please do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my tomato plants have wilted on one side, starting from the bottom up. The other side of the vine looks fine for now. Not sure what is going on. Um, that sounds to me like it might be a vascular wilt disease. Um, because sometimes those will show up on one side before the other. And there are a number of different uh, vascular wilt pathogens. These are pathogens that get in the water conducting vessels of the plant. 
And so some of these diseases that Chris talked about earlier, fusarium wilt, verticillium wilt, those are fungal vascular wilt diseases. And then there's uh, a couple actually of bacterial uh, vascular wilt diseases. And the other thing that can cause vascular wilt type symptoms is um, injury from black walnuts. So black walnuts can produce a chemical called juglone from their roots that causes tomatoes to wilt and it'll cause a discoloration in the vascular system, much like a, a vascular wilt disease. So it's a little bit hard to tell just from the symptoms, you know, which one of those problems it might be. And there's a case where it would be helpful to be able to send a plant in, get a lab diagnosis so you, so you know exactly what you're dealing with. So then you know what kind of resistant variety you need or, or you know, what other uh, control measures you can take. It's, it's, there are not a lot of options for vascular wilt diseases other than resistant varieties because there really aren't um, chemical measures for controlling vascular wilt diseases. These organisms are soil borne and so you're not going to be able to apply some chemical to the soil that's just going to wipe them out in the soil. Um, so that's one where you would, you know, need to get a more specific diagnosis and Hopefully, when we get past COVID-19, we'll be able to uh, process samples like that in the plant disease clinic. So I hope I've answered that question. Um, did you have any more comments on that one, Chris? No, that, you're exactly right. It's a, it's a tough one. Some of those, some of those vascular uh, diseases, um, not much you can do about them. Right. Um, so I it would just encourage people to when you're you know buying your seed or buying your transplants do a little research and find out what diseases uh, those plants are resistant to and these these varieties that are called VFN varieties they have resistance to both fusarium wilt verticillium wilt and root knot nematodes um, so those are those are some good varieties to try. Um, okay, we've got another mammal question. How do I keep chipmunks out of the garden? <laughs> One got my first ripe tomato yesterday. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, um, disappointing. Yeah, um, I think the best thing I could say probably for things like squirrels and chipmunks is trying to, trying to exclude them. It's so difficult. Um, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think some some wire sometimes, some chicken wire type exclusion uh, is a good thing to do if you can build that around uh, your whole garden area or parts of it. Uh, they are they are difficult and so um, small. What's that? They're so small. They're, they're so small. Yeah, and um, yeah, sometimes you have to think about um, planting a little more. Some for your critters and some for you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, one last question on the Q&A. What kind of growth pattern do tomatoes grow in? For example, potatoes grow in the chandelier growth pattern? Um, I'm not sure I've ever heard of that. Uh, what, uh, I think they're talking about the, I, I watched the potato session and the potato, the tubers grow in the chandelier pattern, but of course the tomato fruit is above ground and it's going to be related to the leaf pattern. So yeah. A, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't really know how to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, and I think it, it, it depends on the type of tomato too, like the cherry tomatoes grow in those uh, long. Uh, yeah, I mean. Um, beams or whatever you call them. Yeah, it, it's uh, the trusses on the tomatoes or, or clusters of fruit are going to uh, kind of be very, very similar for, for a lot of the varieties that are out there. Um, but I'm not exactly sure uh, what what exactly they're asking. Yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure either. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is it. There was one question in the in the chat. What is the best time to top? But I don't know that topping is a general recommended practice. Not not really. I mean, it can be done, but um, it's not something you normally do. Okay. Uh, I think we got, I think that we've got everything. So Good. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you um, to all of our presenters today. That was really interesting. I learned a lot about tomatoes. Hopefully everyone else did too. 
Um, so here is a link to where you can find information about future virtual farm to table sessions. I will also follow up with an email with some of the links that our presenters shared today. Um, so you can easily access those and sign up for any future virtual farm to table sessions. Um, our next week's session will be on Friday, July 31st at 2 p.m. and we'll be talking about um, broilers and chicken. Um, so I hope you can join us then. And um, when you close today's session, you will also get an option to fill out a quick survey. So I hope you all will um, take the opportunity to give us a little bit of feedback. It's, it's not too long, just a few questions. Um, so I hope everyone has a great weekend. Um, enjoy.